spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Well, good morning. Aloha. Happy Aloha Friday. I'm Yanji Denise. Ryan Kalei Suji has the day off today, but the show must go on. And so we are shining the spotlight on tourism, welcoming a familiar face to the program. Hawaiian Airlines CEO Peter Ingram is joining us this morning. Peter, thanks for being here. Great to be with you. Aloha. So we are heading toward the end of the summer travel season. Uh, how are we doing? How did Hawaiian Airlines do? And overall, as a state, would you say that tourism is back? Tourism is definitely back. We've seen um, you know, really strong demand uh, from North America um, and you know, a little bit like we saw uh, heading into last summer, but unlike last summer where we got interrupted towards the end of the period by the the Delta variant, we're we're seeing you know things continue to go very strongly. So our our flights have been ninety uh, percent full month in and month out for the last few months from the mainland. Uh, demand is very good. People are keen to travel, and I, I think people from Hawaii have been traveling uh, more this year as well. Uh, international has um, seen some good signs of progress, particularly from Australia and from South Korea. Uh, we're still waiting on uh, Japan to really fully uh, reopen, but I'm very encouraged about where we are from a demand standpoint. We're working hard to um, to build our uh, capabilities up and make sure we've got the right staffing in place. So. Uh, it's been a busy time, but it's but it's good to be busy after the last couple of years we had. Yeah, I'd say so. And I'm interested to know uh, one of the things that the kind of data that you get that the rest of us don't get. You know, we see we feel the busyness, so to speak, but we don't actually know. Are they families? Are they single people? Are they retirees? What's the profile of the visitors who are coming here? We know that last summer it was a lot of people who had not experienced the islands in the past. Are these more of our traditional guests or how would you characterize the folks who are coming? I think things have pretty substantially normalized now. We're back more to, um, to you know, customer demographics that are very similar to where we were uh, pre-pandemic. We, we did have that period in, especially in the early part of 2021, uh, where the people who were traveling uh, tended to be uh, tended to be a little younger. Um, tended to be, um, you, you know, fewer children, uh, fewer people in their sixties and above. But but that has evolved as you know we've moved through different phases of uh, the COVID period, and uh, I think more and more people are uh, open up to. Um, you know, eager to get back to a lot of the experiences that they missed for a while. And, and I think that's across the demographic spectrum now. Uh, let's talk about those international visitors that you mentioned. You know, we keep waiting for the Japan return, but it is slow going. When do you realistically expect uh, the Japanese visitors to return and, and to what volume, you know, what percentage of compared to the before the pandemic do you expect that to look like? So we have seen some uh, recovery in demand and we increased uh, our schedules flying to Japan at the beginning of August to uh, to bring back our service to Haneda Airport, to add some frequency into our uh, Tokyo Narita operation, add some frequency into Osaka. Uh, where, where we've been constrained is largely on the, um, the policies regarding uh, international travelers uh, going into uh, Japan, whether it's Japanese nationals or whether it's visitors. And that's where the restrictions lie. At one point, there was a hard cap on international arrivals at 5,000 per day. Um, now that's up to about 20,000, um, which is 
good progress, um, but not so encouraging when you put it in the context of the fact that prior to the pandemic, there were about 140,000 uh, international arrivals per day into Japanese airports. So we're really only at about one seventh of what capacity could be if, uh, if demand was back to pre-pandemic levels. I do think um, that the Japanese government is um, thinking about opportunities for um, loosening those restrictions. And we think that uh, is likely to happen in the coming months. Obviously, it depends on a lot of factors that, that we don't directly control here in Hawaii, particularly the level of COVID cases they've had in Japan. Uh, they just went through their seventh um, surge of cases. Uh, they've passed the peak of that a couple of weeks ago now. And I think if they continue to come down in cases, there's an, a policy environment that is probably going to allow uh, for some of those restrictions to further ease as we get into October and November. And hopefully we're, uh, if not um, back to normal by the end of the year, um, you know, at least well on the way to uh, to being open up, you know, late this year or early in 2023. And that's that's really what we're planning around as we think about restoring some of the um, the services that we historically had in Japan that have been gone for a couple of years. We're we're planning to increase later this year and uh, even more in the early part of next year, again, depending on how those policy decisions evolve. We know that those international routes are so vital to your bottom line and to the overall, you know, tourism health here or economic health. That is, um, let, let's talk about some of the other routes. You, you know, in uh, during the pandemic, one of the things that Hawaiian Airlines did do was uh, establish this direct route to Orlando, focusing more on the domestic side. That's sunsetting now. Tell us about the experience in Orlando and why you're phasing that out, at least for now. Yeah, that was one of four routes we started in uh, April of uh, of 2021, and and it was really uh, a, a bit of a a bold experiment at that time to um, to try out some new things at a time where demand was um, was just recovering. Uh, Orlando, uh, I would say we had a bit of a mixed experience. We saw strong demand during uh, peak periods, but it had. Uh, a really sharp seasonality that um, that made it difficult. And it, as we looked, um, you know, to the recovery of Japan coming on and the demands that is going to put on our fleet and some of the other constraints that we uh, face over the coming months, we had to make some hard decisions. And, and we've decided um, to suspend Orlando uh, for the time being, at least. Uh, we've we've kept our Austin uh, route running three times a week. We're um, we're keeping our uh, Ontario, California to Honolulu route, our Long Beach to Maui route. So the other things we started around that time are uh, are still in the network. But we had to make a difficult decision about uh, about Orlando as we think about freeing up airplanes for Japan. You know, one of the things, of course, that is a large part of your of your work is the neighbor island flights. Heidi has a question, and this is out of your control, but it does affect the flight experience. She says, can you ask him his thoughts on the situation on Maui's airport with up to three hour waits go through to go through TSA? Mahalo. We know that you don't control that, um, but we see these videos of these long lines and people having to get water. What are your thoughts on what's happening on Maui and just the infrastructure of that airport handling the high demand for that destination. Well, you're right that we don't control it uh, entirely ourselves, but but we take you know responsibility for um, trying to work with uh, our partners, whether it's the DOT or the TSA, to make sure our guests have a, a good experience throughout their journey. And uh, Maui is one that has been uh, a problem. Uh, was a challenge last summer. It's been a challenge this summer. Uh, and, and, you know, unfortunately, some of this was was predictable. We saw Maui's an airport where demand is really back um, to fairly full levels because it is domestic only. And so, you know, as domestic has come back, Maui is um, seeing capacity levels that are, are not only at but exceed what it was before. Um, over the long term, 
um, you know, one of the important solutions we know is we, we just need more checkpoint capacity. And, uh, and that's a facility issue and that takes time um, to build it out. What we've tried to do is um, sit down with our partners at the TSA and at the Department of Transportation and say, uh, okay, there are things that, um, that are gonna take some time to construct new checkpoint lanes that can take up to three years and those plans are in work. But what can we do in the short term to make things better? And um, there have been things that have uh, been brought in that the TSA has brought in um, canine teams um, that help expedite the screening experience. Um, there's been some rearranging of the checkpoint lanes to add an extra pre-check lane. Uh, there are, are now you know, coverings out for people who are waiting in line, all, all of which are, are uh, don't solve the problem and the lines are still, you know, belong the standards that our guests should expect and belong the standards that the TSA um, puts in place for themselves. Uh, but we're, we're working hard to try and see what we can do to make things better in the short term. And then ultimately we need those long-term solutions to, uh, to come into play. Yeah, shade in that situation definitely would make a difference. I want to ask you something that came up throughout the last political campaign leading up to the primary. We saw Lieutenant Governor Josh Green really hammering this idea in his bid for governor of charging an eco fee, if you will, an entry fee to Hawaii. Um, his reasoning for that was that it's at one point during the pandemic uh, for safe travels, people needed to get a COVID test that was running around $150, depending on what provider you used. So he said that we know Know that you know having that barrier to entry is okay because enough people did pay that $150 to get that test. What are your thoughts on adding an entry fee and what that would do to Hawaii as a destination? Uh, I think we should think about these things in the context of uh, of all of the contributions that our visitors make to uh, to our economy and into our tax revenues and. You know, when you think about it, we we charge our visitors uh, a lot today. They pay tourism accommodation taxes that have gone up substantially uh, in recent years. That money goes into the state's coffers. It also goes directly into the uh, the county's coffers now. Uh, the, as hotel prices have increased over the last year, because those are a percentage of accommodation costs, um, those tax revenues have gone up and up over the last um, year or two. The um, GET is another area where um, we get substantial revenue from uh, visitors. So I, I, I think th these are all, you know, interesting concepts to discuss. We should just um, think about them thoughtfully and, and probably best away from the uh, the emotion of political campaigns, but think about them in, in totality and try and come up with the right balance of how we raise revenue, but also have, uh, have the ability uh, for people to come and visit us and fuel our businesses and fuel our employment and make sure we're not um, killing the golden goose of the, um, the most important contributor to Hawaii's economy and Hawaii's employment. Well, interesting, because one of the ways the counties have been trying to manage tourism and sort of stop the loving of Hawaii to death of certain popular destinations is to add these user fees to certain spots uh, through reservation systems like Diamond Head, of course, Hanauma Bay and uh, Haleakala. But there are lots of talk. There's lots of talk throughout all the counties to do this at a lot more destinations. What are your thoughts on having those user fees to you know limit the number of people, but that also adds cost to someone's overall trip to Hawaii and could impact a decision on whether or not to come here. We're definitely supportive of, uh, of coming up with ways um, to find money to make sure we're able to invest in preserving and caring for, whether it's our beaches or our trails or hikes, uh, and you know, making sure that, um, that, that if we're going to charge these fees, um, that we direct that revenue um, specifically into uh, preserving, you know, whether it's whether it's Diamond Head or Hanama Bay is a great example of how we've uh, we've done this for years and years. Uh, I would 
Uh, I would hope that as we add these uh, and consider these incrementally, we think about a way to make the experience user friendly, whether it's for those of us who live in Hawaii who want to enjoy these experiences or whether it's for visitors uh, coming and having a patchwork of, um, you know, different reservations um, systems and different fee structures is probably not a, a good way to make it user friendly. So again, I, I think we can have reasonable conversations and sit down and try and think of thoughtful ways to create a good experience to make sure we're investing in uh, preserving our infrastructure, and and there there are there are reasonable outcomes to be reached here. I think. Let's talk a little bit about employment. There was a great article in the paper yesterday uh, talking about Hawaiian Airlines and the investment and partnership with uh, HCC. Tell us a little bit more about that for folks maybe who didn't read the article or just want to learn more about what you're doing to sort of train the next generation of workers for the airline and beyond. I mean, those folks aren't necessarily only going to work for Hawaiian Airlines, but they are working in partnerships with your employees and developing a tremendous skill set. Yeah, this is something I'm uh, I'm very excited about, and we've uh, we've worked with uh, the Honolulu uh, Community College for a number of years with their uh, their aircraft maintenance uh, program, and and have a number of people working for us today uh, who have been through that program and benefited from it. Uh, one of the things we've we've understood over the last couple of years is that there's a big backlog of people looking to get into that program at the same time um, that we have lots of open jobs uh, for aircraft mechanics. And, um, you know, it really took us sitting down uh, with the folks from HCC and understanding, okay, well, what's the constraint to opening up this pipeline a little wider if there is demand for more people to come in? And the challenge they were having was finding qualified instructors so that they could expand uh, the number of people who could um, could go through that program each year. And as we thought about it, we said, well, one solution is we uh, take some of our instructors uh, who you know work in our operation every day, training our mechanics, whether it's recurrent training or new hire training, and, uh, and have them um, spend some time working with um, with HCC and um, providing um, the instructors. And by doing that, we're able to double the number of people who can go through that uh, program. Uh, we'd love to see it grow even uh, further from there. And, um, you know, what, what we get out of it is uh, a greater pipeline of people who are trained for jobs that are very much in need. And I, I would underscore, these are, these are excellent jobs. Uh, for people, and and in a time when you know many of us talk about um, you know lamenting the fact that our young people are leaving the islands because there are better job opportunities elsewhere, here's a way where we can take local people, give them an opportunity to get a job that starts at about uh, sixty thousand dollars a year, and quickly accelerates to what can be over a hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, you know, good local jobs for local uh, people who are willing to work hard and, and apply themselves. And being able to connect those dots is something I'm very proud of. And I, I look forward to um, building and growing this partnership even more in the future. Yeah, it's a fantastic read. If you haven't had a chance, please go check out yesterday's paper because it's really exciting to read about something like that. And you're right, we hear about so many folks heading to the mainland to get that kind of training and then perhaps not making their way back. So this is really exciting. Let's talk about other employment opportunities at your airline right now. Um, what's hiring been like? We hear about it uh, from the city to retail to restaurants uh, and, and everything in between. Everyone's having a hard time finding workers, uh, who are you looking for? Who are you hiring? And, and what's hiring like right now at Hawaiian? Um, we're looking for great people in a variety of, of parts of our company. Uh, you know, I was just um, meeting with our team yesterday and reviewing some of our recruiting stats. And uh, we have year to date hired over 1,200 people in our company. We're recruiting in uh, virtually every part of the company. We've hired uh, pilots at a pace of 24 a month for several months in a row. We've had a number of, of uh, flight attendant classes coming in and we're still recruiting there. 
Uh, our airports throughout the state uh, are recruiting. We just talked about mechanics and we're, we're bringing people in in our, uh, our offices. So it is, it is really throughout the business um, that we have opportunities as demand has, uh, has recovered. Uh, we're, we're keen to, uh, you know, get the message out and uh, find those people. And, and we've, had, we've had success, but we still have more work to do. You know, I just reflect when I hear you say, you know, the planes are in some cases are at 90 percent capacity. A lot of routes restored, like Maui, for instance, to, you know, full levels. You're hiring all these folks. You're at such a different place. And it's been wonderful to sort of track your journey as sort of a, you know, insight into the tourism economy, uh, because I, I'll i never forget it. At one point early on in the pandemic, you came on and said that Hawaiian was losing three and a half million dollars a day. Um, and just, I, I'm just interested to get your reflection on sort of the, the trajectory of the airline, where you see things going, how, how you're doing overall financially right now, and where you see it going. Yeah, you, you're, you're right. This is uh, very different than some of the conversations we had um, 12 months ago or two years ago in particular when, when we were virtually, uh, virtually shut down. Uh, in some ways, even worse than shut down because we still had all the expenses of a, a business. We just didn't have the revenue. Uh, but um, we, we've come a long way back. We're, we're not at profitability yet. And obviously, um, you know, to be sustainable for the long term, uh, we have to get to that. Getting Japan on board is going to be uh, a big part of that uh, for us. Uh, but it is it's an encouraging time. And, you know, for, you know, not just for myself, but for all of our team, um, you know, the last couple of years have been uh, incredibly traumatic at time. And it's, it's been a real uh, roller coaster. And frankly, for a lot of people, it was pretty frightening. And in, um, in 2020, especially some of our veteran employees who have been through uh, the trials and tribulations over uh, the decades, uh, it's a scary time when, um, when your business is almost shut down. So um, seeing demand uh, and you know, having to work through a very different set of challenges right now, I can tell you that uh, I'll take take these challenges in 2022 over the ones we had in 2020 any day. Uh, this is um, this is a much better place to be, and uh, we'll we'll figure out the um, the stuff we need to figure out now. But it's uh, at least we've got something to work with. Yeah, and, and part of that also gives you the breathing room to give back. I wanted to ask you uh, to highlight some of the food sustainability efforts that Hawaiian has been making just because it is such an exciting thing. We talk so much about needing to uh, increase our food sustainability. One of the things that pan the pandemic highlighted, something that we know is a problem, but really you know felt on every level when uh, we started to get worried that maybe the ships wouldn't come. Uh, tell us about the investment that Hawaiian is making in that area. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, an area we, we talk about uh, a fair bit. And, you know, we are um, one of the things um, that we have done recently is we've committed to increasing uh, over time the amount of uh, local food supply that goes into what we serve uh, on our aircraft and, and building that up. That was part of our commitment in our corporate Kuleana report this year. Uh, but recently, I think what you're highlighting is a uh, a contribution that um, we have made from the Hawaiian Airlines Foundation um, to provide a, uh, a wash station for uh, local farmers uh, who are producing uh, goods, but you know, really don't have um, the infrastructure means to be able to get those goods to market so that they can generate revenue, get those goods to uh, businesses who consume what they're producing on their local farms. And uh, so we made a contribution to, uh, to help build uh, what is called a wash uh, station or wash facility, which is where uh, the produce from the fields uh, comes and gets prepared. Uh, clean so it can be packaged. And um, this um, just helps those local farmers take that next step to be able to getting to where they can turn what they're producing on their farms into, uh, into revenue that they can then reinvest in their business and support their communities. And um, we're, we're ec excited to be able to, uh, to do those things. Our Hawaiian Airlines Foundation is something 
uh, we put in place several years ago to really focus uh, in a, a few uh, key areas where we want to contribute to our community, whether it being in the um, cultural areas, language areas, education. And um, this is a great project. And it also provided an opportunity for uh, many of the members of our team to be able to go and volunteer and work on some of those farms and and uh, have a good experience wearing their rubber boots and getting in the mud for a little while on the afternoon, which is great team building for us as well. Absolutely. Uh, we're almost out of time. Before I let you go, you know, tourism, as we noted throughout our conversation, uh, has really been at the forefront of so much of the political conversation that's been going on. And uh, I wanted to just get your final thoughts as we head into, you know, preparing for the winter season. And, uh, you know, a, a year ago, people kind of bristled at having this influx of people. How do you see, you know, we have this continuing conversation about managing tourism, making sure that we greet our guests with aloha, but also uh, feeling like we don't want Hawaii to be loved to death. How do you see us sort of striking that balance so that we can, you know, protect the place we love. But of course, you know, as you know, it is, it is our economic engine. And so we need to protect our jobs as well. Yeah, I think balance is the right word, Jinji. It, I'm, you know, when, when we think about sustainability, um, I think about it in terms of uh, environmental sustainability, cultural sustainability, and economic sustainability. And uh, we need all three of those um, to be in place for our community to be, to be healthy and to be thriving and to have the future uh, we all want for ourselves and, and for the generations um, that follow us. And I, I think the best way to, uh, to help us manage through these things is for us to really just um, get all of the um, the different interests at the table and have thoughtful discussions and be open to um, to alternatives. It's not just, um, you know, one idea coming from one group and that's the direction we should go. It's thinking about what is in the best interest of of our community more broadly from all, all of those fronts. And we would love to continue to be a part of that conversation. This has been our home for 92 years and we expect it to be our home uh, for generations to come and we want to make sure that we're um, we're working to make it a better place for for all of us every day okay well peter ingram ceo of hawaiian airlines thank you so much for joining us this morning and for giving us the update it sounds like great things are happening at hawaiian thank you so much thank you well, great to hear from Peter. And if you missed any part of our conversation, please do go back and watch this again from the beginning when the live stream is POW. You can also catch it as a podcast later this afternoon or watch it on Channel 50. They rebroadcast it throughout the day for the next several days. Very interesting to get his take on where we are uh, sort of as a state overall when it comes to tourism. You hear a lot about, uh, you know, he talked a lot about how the routes are really restored, that, you know, the planes are flying at 90% capacity and to a lot of destinations, and that is good news. Domestic travel really is going well uh, when they looked at the summer. Uh, but international, of course, there are still some pukas there that they need to fill, and that really highlights the need for Japan to open up. That's something that is out of the airline's control. It's not just Hawaiian. Other airlines would like to see those routes open up. Those are government restrictions from Japan directly, but they are hoping that in the next few months, those start to lift and that those routes can be restored. That will, of course, help the bottom line of the airline, which is doing much better, uh, as he noted, than, we'd ha than, he than it was in conversations past, but still has some way to go. That said, they're doing a lot of hiring there. And if you missed uh, yesterday's article in the paper, I do encourage you to go back and read it because they're doing something really exciting with Honolulu Community College, taking the airline mechanics, um, helping those folks who help to instruct the in-house pilot or, or mechanics at Hawaiian Airlines and having those folks actually train students at HCC, creating a pipeline for then trained workers to go and get these really high quality, great jobs. And they can do the whole thing uh, front to back right here in the islands, which is really what we want to see. Um, interested to get his thoughts on user fees and also the, you know, all that talk that we've heard from the Lieutenant Governor and other candidates about entry fees, some trepidation there. Uh, talking about just how much uh, you, uh, visitors are already taxed 
um, and maybe that not being the best idea, at least from the airline's perspective, but also support there for, you know, things like Hanauma Bay and other entry fees for different destinations so that we can protect those places. Overall, a very informative question, uh, conversation and the airline is hiring. So if you are in the market for a job, uh, make sure to check that out. We will be back here on Monday where we'll be shining the spotlight on homelessness. The city launched the core program about a year ago. So Dr. Jim Ireland from EMS, along with the woman who is in charge of running the core program will be joining us to talk about what those services are like day to day. Um, how many people are they actually helping? Did this actually achieve or is it achieving what they want it to when it comes to uh, helping to reduce some of the impact on emergency services and the police department in an, interacting with the homeless and also helping to get uh, those folks the services they need so they can get off the street. We'll be exploring the core program that's coming up right here on Monday. Day. Have a great weekend. We'll see you right back here at 1030. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.